We explored the themes of agriculture, food, and waste in season four. Something that we did not get into too much detail was the idea of hunger, which is caused by the lack of food. So, when Dr. Jane Battersby, who was our guest this season, posted about the Hunger Museum on LinkedIn, I was intrigued. The Hunger Museum is a virtual museum that takes a deep dive into the history of hunger and how it can be ended. For today's bonus episode, we speak to Abby Liebman. President and CEO of Mason, the organization that conceptualized the Hunger Museum. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not necessarily occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers, and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. We'll we'll start from the top, which is about the museum itself. And the museum, I think, very simply and aptly is called the Hunger Museum. And when you think about museums, ideally, uh, typically you would think about museums that are centered around ideas which have something that can be um, physically shown or expressed or experienced. But then hunger is not on top of my list of museums where I would think about a museum for something. I've been to toy museums. Um, We've seen Holocaust museums, history museums. But how did this idea of building a museum around hunger came about? Well, it started as a desire to think about the the origins of, of hunger in America, if you will, and what we how we responded to them. So it was really more in this idea of conversation about we knew um, based on what we at Mazon know about hunger um, and our government's response to it, that there was a moment in our history when in the United States, we really almost ended hunger in America. And, and that stopped. And so some of this began in a conversation simply about how important it was to recognize that this is actually not a, a problem of scarcity of resources or troubles with food systems. It's a, a problem of political will. It's mm. a question of do the people who govern this country make it enough of a priority to address those who are struggling with hunger in a meaningful way, to really d- dig into why are they hungry? And then what can we do to create support systems, responses, opportunities so that they no longer struggle? Mm. So originally we thought about doing a timeline. Um, and this was like sometime in early 2019, I think I know I do all of my time between before the pandemic and after the pandemic and I, or in the pandemic, whatever we are right now. So it was definitely before the pandemic. So it's been years that we've talked about this and originally it was going to be a timeline, but I didn't want it to be just a, a flat timeline, if you will, that moved from, you know, sort of lurching from one moment in history to the next. I wanted it to feel as if people could experience all the elements that were making up life in those particular periods of time. You know, we'll, we, so when you see a timeline of, you know, a development of an artist's work, you typically see what was happening in the art world. And sometimes a little bit about what was happening in the country of origin, but what I was thinking is, well, there are things happening in art and culture and pop culture and the the ideas of economics versus, you know, social programs and religion and all kinds of things, immigration, social policies. And I wanted all of that to wrap around these moments uh, that we saw as important historical touchstones in the history of them. So it was supposed to be a timeline. And then the pandemic, a physical, it was like a piece of paper, you know, something that would go around the perimeter of a room. Mm. And 
be, you know, embellished in some way so it looks pretty. There are apparently very fancy ways of doing timelines <laughs> I learned in this process. I did not know. Um, and we then realized, well, we have to take it online. And we started to talk about, well, we could do pictures then. We could do something a little more elaborate. Maybe it's interactive. I can't tell you exactly who and how it then evolved into this notion of it feels more like a museum mm. because we were talking about periods of time that became galleries and within those galleries moments to explore in depth and that's really how it turned into this museum but a lot of it is really rooted in the idea that if we don't really look at our history then you know it's it's trite to say this, but then we are doomed to repeat it. And that's what we've been doing. And yeah. we're stuck. And to get unstuck, you have to see who was thinking in a visionary way years ago and what vision did they have? And is that still salient now? I mean, I'm not so stuck that I think that, well, solutions that worked in the 1960s and 70s, well, they may not work right now in the 2020s, but... There's something there about what was the goal orientation? What were they trying to do? And to dig at that a little bit more and say to ourselves, well, we knew we could do it that way then. We can do it this way now. But if we don't even try, then we're stuck. Mm. So what we've been doing this season is we've been talking um, to a lot of different people about three broad ideas. So we've been talking about production of food, so agriculture, um, mm -hmm. food as in the food that we eat, the processed version of it. And then we've been mm -hmm. talking about waste as in the food waste that is um, left. Mm -hmm. And throughout this season, we've been having conversations that deal with uh, different economics of what it means to uh, be working or dealing with global food systems or food supplies, the imbalance in those systems, the way seeds are modified, uh, the nutrition that we derived out of it. And in fact, the the reason I came across um, the Hunger Museum because one of our guests, she posted on LinkedIn about the museum and her right. work, Dr. Jane Battersby, she, her work is about uh, food deserts in, in Africa. And mm -hmm. that's also something that we're looking at is it's not just the availability of food that uh, ensures nutrition in the food and just how people have or do not have access to that food. Now, mm -hmm. what I did not realize while doing all of the season is we were talking about food in and out, but hunger is almost like the other side of the coin, right? So if you're talking about food mm -hmm. on one side, Hunger is almost the other side of the coin where it kind of implies mm -hmm. that there is no availability of food or there's no availability of that nutrition in proper amounts. Now, when we're looking at the Hunger Museum as a broad idea or a broad concept, at the first go, it seems um, a little bit disorienting in the sense, how do we come to terms with the fact that a museum is... Uh, the right idea, right building typology to associate an idea of hunger. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, while we're moving towards this artificial intelligence, metaverse, virtual reality world, um, mm -hmm. public space like museums, you know, a lot of them move their programming online during COVID, but then once, you know, the COVID was over, everyone went back to accessing those physical spaces. Mm -hmm. What do you think that does with the idea of access, broadly access as an access to food, which leads to hunger and mm -hmm. access to public spaces like museums. And I'm asking this very selfishly because um, we as architects have been obsessed with the design of museums. You know, every famous architect will yeah. have built a museum here and there. So you look at Daniel Libeskind's mm -hmm. Jewish Museum, you see the Guggenheim by Frank Lloyd Wright. Right. And now you're... Um, building a virtual museum you've actually <laughs> built it um yeah just reflect on the broad idea of of access be the museum and how closely or loosely tied is it is to the idea of hunger because it almost seems uh um 
poetic and metaphorical in the sense that in a way I appreciate that it's virtual so that everybody is able to access it. But the way you guys have gone ahead and done it is you've actually designed a physical space which exists in the virtual world. I don't even know how to explain how to explain yeah, that. Yeah, but it's okay. Um, we don't either. Yeah. But, but, yeah. <laughs> so we think, you know, I think it was one of my colleagues who said it's not 3D, it's 2.5D. It's something a little more immersive than what is a flat web page, but at the yes. same time, it's not virtual reality because I say those words and get nauseous. So I can't, I'm not yes. good at that whole thing. Yeah. But I want to go back a little bit to the beginning of your remarks and then loop back to here. Mm -hmm. So even you know, listening as you begin to describe the elements that you're exploring this season, that think of how complicated that is. I mean, there's just all, all of these different access points and relationships between systems when we just talk about food systems. Mm -hmm. And when you layer into that a notion of food justice, which is really where the anti-hunger movement fits, yeah, um, that you add another layer of complexity there. And so when I was alluding to the fact of what we wanted people to experience, this is not just the complexity of the systems designed around food and hunger, but the complexity of people's lives mm. of what it is that happens to us as human beings. Is not one segment, right? It's everything in our lives is affecting the way we are living our lives and getting across that complexity was an important part of what we wanted to convey with the museum, that there's a lot going on here and it is complicated and that, we made choices about what to explore more deeply, what to really highlight. And, you know, the more you immerse yourself in the museum and its galleries, the more questions we expect that you will have about, mm. well, where did this go? And can I go even deeper here? But it was also important for us to reflect for people about how normalized the issues of hunger have become certainly in our country mm. and to speak a way of conveying that in a space where people feel like they are looking at something in an immersive way right mm. so when you go into a museum especially a museum that has a particular theme or purpose if you will um, you know you're going in to be immersed in that experience. And we wanted to create that sensibility, but we also wanted people to feel as if they were entering a space. They're entering a, a time of really focused attention. I mean, one of the things that is often a challenge about working in the virtual universe is that there are a lot of things that can distract you from what you mm. are doing. You appear to be present but really you could be listening to anything you yeah. could be really looking at something else I could be a very skilled typist and I could be busy here doing something else like writing a thesis about something yeah even while I'm talking to you and this is something that we hoped would capture people's imagination in a way where you respect the idea that you have entered a space you are in a a um a space that conveys focus, quiet, um, being thoughtful. I, I mean, I think about how human beings react in museums, right? We tend to speak, we lower our voices. We speak with a degree of respect. We are focused on what we're looking at and what we're experiencing with other senses. I mean, to me, the regret of what happens in the virtual space is that you are isolated from other human beings. So the sensibilities that you get and what you pick up from when you're in a, a public space are somewhat lost here. Um, but the, and the, you reduce to a lot of the visual yeah. um, and the, yeah. and the auditory. So that, that the sen the other senses, the feeling, the the um, smell, all that you can't. When we had, believe me, we went off on a, a number of tangents about things we, if it were real, what we could do, and just you know, we could have an exhibit that was about you know recipes that were from the you know the Great Depression, and and 
you could smell what it would smell like. And it, we're, yeah, we we're people of great. Yeah. yeah, I would say let's call it imagination and creativity. Often it is like going off topic, but we are. Um, mm. I I think I think we wanted to convey the seriousness of this. Also, that this is a topic that is complicated and diverse and and very much informed and created by a lot of systemic challenges in the United States. And so you wanted people to understand that, yeah, it takes a whole museum to look at this because this isn't easy stuff and it isn't simple stuff. And um, there is a narrative arc in the museum. There's probably more than one. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, and so we wanted it to feel like you were really entering a space. I guess that's the easiest way to say this. Um, rather than the very long way I've gotten to, um, it is, um, it's also what, um, our architect conveyed by what he designed. I mean, this will be lost on some people, but we picked certain materials. Um, we wanted to create a sense of gravitas, um, but something that is grounded in the past, but is future oriented it's looking to the future that there's a sense of optimism in the space there's feels like there's a lot of light and air and space inside the museum and that's deliberate these are choices that we made with our architect to help people come in and not feel burdened by everything they're going to see but to understand that there is action that we can take that can resolve all of this. So it has a sense of hope in it, just even in the way the space feels. And I think also in a way, um, hypothetically, the location of the Mm. museum, even though virtually is so significant, if you want to talk about where. Yeah, um, Yeah, it's it's located. um, So it's in Washington, D.C. It is located with the Washington Monument right behind it and in between Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Holocaust Museum. A physical impossibility in Washington, D.C. You can't actually do that. Also partly because that land, there is some land there, but it's, you can't build on it. So it is, um, we, we did want to create this idea, the symbolism of that, you know, we are a Jewish organization and Jews are very steeped in history. Mm. Every year we spend a year reviewing the complete history of our people um, from thousands of years ago. And we retell stories all the time because we see the relevance of those stories now, thousands of years later, and we're learning from them all all the time. So thinking about what is a a very dominant part of uh, the history of Jews in the world, which is the Holocaust, um, and um, and a devastating experience, but one that um, also we hope, you know, taught the world the the, the truth of never again, Mm. that this cannot happen again. So again, there's these ideas there, right, of this is a really dark time, and yet what emerged from it, we hope, is a sense of commitment from the world that this is something we will never tolerate again. And then, although I'm not naive, we do tolerate it everywhere in the world and there are terrible genocides yeah. and human rights abuses everywhere. Um, but at least the symbolism was there. Um, yeah. And then, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture is in the United States, the government agency that is responsible for the nutrition safety net in America. Mm. And that that agency is the the government's response um perhaps a little too narrowly i might add that there are other agencies that have responsibilities in other areas that should in fact be engaged in a lot more of this work but we like the symbolism between jewish and agriculture and that that creates a a moment for people in terms if you're aware enough to understand where we're at and i think i i I think it's also um appropriate for the museum to exist in the virtual space because 
logistically, if I was thinking, you know, the kind of resources and the capital that would go into building and maintaining a physical museum would kind of defy the purpose of it being for, sure. um, you know, something mm -hmm. that deals with uh, a problem like hunger. But um, mm -hmm. The, the virtual museum itself is also extremely elaborate. And uh, when I was talking to Lisa the other day, I referred to this one allegory about um, the American progress going from east to west. It's um, um, mm -hmm. a woman in the sky with a torch. And that's, that's an allegory that is very frequently used uh, in academic classes at Harvard as well. And that's where I had seen it the first time as, oh. how, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost... Uh, depicting uh, progress as movement from savagery to development, you know, the electric road, right, the railway, uh, the train that goes, you know, from darkness yeah. to light, and, and she's carrying books with her. And um, my friend yes. and I teach this course, and we always bring back that allegory. Um, so it was really nice to see that and how, you know, the idea of development and the idea of food, how they kind of go um, together. Is there mm -hmm. any particular gallery or exhibit that uh, you think is very appealing and that you want to talk about? So I I very much um, love the, the the gallery that uh, is about um, that's the uh, America in Crisis and Recovery. Um, and then the World War II and the paradoxes of the post-war era, both of those, because they're deeply steeped in there's a lot of photography in them I I love photography um mm. there's there there are different moments in here there's things there are posters from that time I think it's really evocative of that time um there are um commercials that you can play there's a tv interview that you can play play a, a clip of there's a uh, but there's also the photographs of Dorothea Lange and um, I am a big fan of her work because I mm. thought it was really evocative of, of of what was happening but also because I know she did this as a part of a government project and that she had she made very deliberate choices and was very steeped in the stories she was trying to tell with any one photograph and i i love the idea that there are all these different ways of interacting in that space with the history mm -hmm. um but i also am mindful of the fact that the museum reveals some narrative arcs that most of us overlook during those times mm -hmm. about the the amplification of racial injustice that was happening in that time um the the deep sexism that was very present in that time about the roles of women um in this country and and around the world actually um so i find it to be um a, the sort of perfect example of what i was hoping we could do with this which mm. is here are these different ways of communicating there's different ways of absorbing information and different kinds of information that you may not have thought about. I mean, what did it mean that we developed frozen TV dinners? What did that do in terms of access to food and in terms of creating opportunities for those who had heretofore been boxed out of the paid workforce? What did it do in, in terms of investments in food pre production? And, mm. uh, you know, we just don't think about all of that. It's that complicated. We think of like, oh, it created convenience. It did a lot more than that. Mm. And, and so I think um, those are the, that, you know, particular, those two particular galleries, I really am. Mm. Um, I really like visiting them and mm. being there <laughs> in that space. Um, so you did mention how uh, Mazon, the organization, is kind of built on Jewish values, and you spoke about that a little bit mm -hmm. and how uh, mm -hmm. even hypothetically it's located between the Department of Agriculture and the Holocaust Museum. Now, mm -hmm. I'm also aware that uh, the museum, in the way it's designed and curated, is not specifically built... Uh, 
to highlight issues of a particular faith or culture. It's kind of more right. uh, broad in terms of its outlook mm-hmm. towards history, towards the people who it mm-hmm. offers access to. Um, mm-hmm. My question is, in your advocacy and because uh, this is a museum that is not just a history lesson that you are actively right. working towards some kind of action oriented goals or uh, you know bringing about change how do you see the museum fit into the larger idea of trying to find a solution or find a better way to address the question of hunger well in part because the we tell the history of when we almost did it so mm. one of the things that is evident um, as you move through the museum and you are you enter into the galleries regarding the 1960s and 1970s you can see that there were policies and programs put into place that began to see um, results in deep declines in the number of Americans who were food insecure we saw that again during the the recent pandemic lockdown times Um, and so we know that we 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 do we the royal we knows how um, to actually begin to have an impact on those who struggle with this. But um, again, there's this lack of political will. And but there was a time when there was the political will, although that was also a time of great, um, you know, partisanship and political divisiveness. I mean, right. you just have to think about what was happening in the '60s, but. I think there are some significant differences that you begin to see as you delve deeper into the history and stay in those moments where it really matters who's in leadership. It really matters about what they, they've they brought from their own backgrounds into those leadership roles, What mm-hmm. they, that they have vision, but it's never enough to have a vision. You have to not only have vision, but but the commitment to realizing that vision and the abilities that allow you to actually realize that mission, that vision. Mm. It's not, this isn't something that happens all by itself. Just because you had this brilliant idea, you've got to be able to make it real. And I think that that's what we were seeing um, because when then President Lyndon Johnson was crafting the war on poverty and the great society programs, he was somebody who came out of the US Senate. He had a tremendous influence in the US Senate. And even though it was a divided body, and even though the House was also a divided body, he could push these things through. And it, in doing so, um, he he basically used his leadership to signal that government is really here to support the people of the country that the, right. that it governs. Right? That it this isn't about enriching some portion of the electorate it's about government being a support system for Mm -hmm. anyone who needs it Mm -hmm. so i think that the um the ideas of history are invaluable here but i also can see for us if you don't come from a perspective of values in our cases jewish values which are fairly universal about the idea of justice the idea of what in Hebrews Bet Salam Elohim that all human beings are made in the image of God, meaning that there is no judgment because we are we are all the same. This could be I. It isn't a question of me distancing myself from you. We are the same. Mm. And and at Mazom, we we really emphasize the idea of not judging people who have struggles that we don't have. Um and instead, talking about what do they need and how can we get it to them? Um, because by doing so, we enrich all of us in a way that that moves everyone forward. That's the point. Um, and um, and those values help us to enter this space, to have created this space. Yeah. And we may not name them throughout the museum, but they are very evident for anyone who has any familiarity with what we what we articulate as the ways in which we approach this work. 
Mm. As you move through the museum, you will feel them. They're there. Mm. So the museum has been live for two odd weeks, I think. Um, what's yeah. next <laughs> in terms, uh, <laughs> in terms of programming, in terms of um, sure. activities? Um, what's well, the I what's the vision? Okay, so if I say anything other than well, we're gonna really push up <laughs> my my staff will actually come from wherever they are and they will haul me away somewhere. Um, so I, I think that the this is you know sort of echoing back our earlier conversation about access and virtual versus real and metaverses and all that that um, the what we wanted was for this space to be as available as possible, but it's yeah. only as available as people know about it. Yeah. So what comes with this work is the need to push out this resource to some unexpected places, to mm -hmm. unusual places, because we want everybody to see this because anyone and everyone can experience hunger and should all have an understanding of what our history is around this and what we can do in the future. So it, we wanted classrooms as, you know, 12 year olds to be able to have a, a group experience watching together, looking at the museum together. And, you know, if we had built this in DC, the idea of a cross country field trip would have been prohibitively yeah. for most people and that wouldn't happen. But this is a way to create that, that kind of visit um, and allows us to push this to a place where it might not otherwise go. Cause we loved the idea that it was one of your guests who would not be a person we would ordinarily have thought we were reaching, who we actually did reach, who then told you so this is a lot of this is about the idea of how do we share yeah. and, and how do we invest in resources that allow us to share. So that's what this museum is. This museum is really about sharing information together to problem solve together. Yeah. And our work now, which is a heavy lift for us mm -hmm. is to move this museum out of the, the sort of niche attention that it's getting to broad-based audience yeah, attention to, yeah. to those who are advocates, those who are advocates in waiting, those who had no real understanding of why it was that there are people who are relying on school meals to, you know, I'm here in Los Angeles, the many of the workers in the schools and the teachers went out on strike and sympathy with those workers. And what clicked in immediately, which is a lesson from the pandemic, was an opportunity for parents to come to schools and still pick up the breakfast and lunch that their children ordinarily get during the school day. Yeah. And we learned that during the pandemic. So we we are learning. We can see that with small changes, we have big impact. Mm. And, you know, I think that that's a deep lesson in this museum. Um, you can see how we undid the solutions that we had crafted, and it doesn't take much. Yeah. Um, so they can be restored, or perhaps they need to be restored plus, you know, that that's yeah. not just good enough to go back to what it was and we were content let's do bigger let's do more but the idea is the next big thing here is marketing the museum to the world so that the world can experience this absolutely if you see it you will understand why it has to be ended so that's good for us special thanks to ayushi thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. For guest and topic suggestions, you can get in touch with us through Instagram or our website artofcenter.com, both of which are A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E. -F -F -E. And thank you for listening.